Hey, you just found the world's number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast now on YouTube. This is Mind Pump. Okay, in today's episode, we talk to women in their 40s and the things that they need to focus on, and we're doing a giveaway, okay? So here's what we want you to do, and you can win a prize. By the way, here's your prize. You'll actually get a box of Four Sigmatics Mushroom Elixir Blend that includes a good dose of cordyceps. I love cordyceps for improved exercise performance. Okay, so here's how you win this box right here. In the comments, in the first 24 hours, put down some stuff that has worked for you to get your body in shape, things that are like game changers for you. Now, what Doug's going to do is he's going to look through all the comments, and if so long as it's been in the first 24 hours that this episode drops, if he picks your comment as the best one, we'll mail you this box from for Sigmatic. One more thing before we start the episode, you're going to hear us talk about four things that women in their 40s tend to need to focus on in order to get into amazing shape. Uh, they include lifting weights to build muscle and speed up the metabolism. Uh, they include you know, how to work with your diet, intuitive eating, a much better way to work with your nutrition, mobility issues, how to work on your mobility to prevent yourself from getting injured and maximizing the results of your workouts, and of course, time demands, how you can get workouts anywhere, not just at the gym, but rather at home or anywhere you have a little bit of space. Okay. So with that, uh, we have something called the Fabuli Fabulous 40 Bundle. This is bundles, multiple workout programs that tend to benefit this particular category of people. So in this includes MAPS Anabolic, an incredible program for building muscle and boosting the metabolism. We have MAPS Anywhere, which gives you workouts that you could do anywhere, uh, require minimal equipment or no equipment. We have MAPS Prime, which will help you work on your mobility. And then in there is also included the intuitive nutrition guide to help you with your diet. Now, because of this episode, we're putting that bundle 50% off. So we're taking the whole price, which is already discounted, by the way, and we're cutting it an additional 50% off. If you want to learn more, if you just want to sign up, go check it out at mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code FAB50. That's F-A-B-5-0. All right. Enjoy the podcast. So I have a, a topic that I think would be good for us to talk about. I think we've mentioned uh, this topic like in like quas, but I don't think we've done a full dedicated episode to the demographic that I think we train the most of. Mm -hmm. So when I think back to all the clients uh, that I've trained, I would say most of them, so north of 50, 60% uh, fell in this category. And that is kind of like the... 35 to 55 female that wants to get in shape, normally wants to lose some body fat, probably had a kid or two, or maybe trying to have a kid, uh, maybe even like a single woman that's working, like in that mm -hmm. age group with those types of goals, I would say is was my biggest- Yeah, that was client. the most common client for sure. For absolutely. Uh, women in their 40s. Uh, well, first off, women in general were larger consumers of personal training. And then in their 40s, once they, in the age group, that was probably the largest. So I, I would agree with you, Adam. I would say probably made up 65% of my clientele over the course of the you know decades to two decades that I trained. Now, why do you guys think that is? Why do you think that if we're, we're all we all trained in different facilities mm -hmm. and we're you know, but yet we all got the same percentage probably of this clientele? What what do you think well, that is? In general, and I'll just this is just a just an observation. In general, women are more likely to ask yeah, more uh, receptive for uh, seeking out help. Yes, yes, they're more open for professional assistance whereas men, you know, you know how we can be sometimes, right? We don't want to ask for directions. We don't want to look at the directions when we're put, building something. Yeah. And so men tend to be less likely to ask a trainer, "Hey, can you help me design a routine?" And then in terms of the age group, I think once you get to a certain point, uh, you a you don't have time to waste. So mm -hmm. you're like, look, I, I, you know, if I if I'm in my 20s and I got all this expendable time, whatever, I'll go figure it out. But look, I don't got a lot of time. I want to do this the right way. And then they have expendable income. They're they're probably working more successful, and so they it makes sense to hire somebody to figure it out to do it uh, the right way. Well, it's interesting too. I, I wonder if we could go back and look at the statistics of, you know, when you get that five starter pack uh, when you're selling like memberships at the gym, yeah. like who actually was receptive to using those? Because I know I I remember I used to open up and, and try and walk the floors and, and convince a lot of the guys and a lot of other people to, uh, you know, take advantage of that. But uh, not a lot would, but I would be able to convince. Uh, oh, I could give you an idea women. of that. I don't remember the exact percentage of that, but- it was it was very rare 
that. So what Justin's talking about, back in the days we used to sell these memberships that they wrapped five personal training sessions within it. So mm-hmm. it'd be what uh, you know they would sell. It was a prepaid membership. Yeah. So you keep fit plus. Yeah, there you go. It was a key fit keep plus, plus is what they called it. And it was, you know, it ranged from, I think I remember seeing as low as maybe six, $700 to as high as like $1,400. And you were prepaying three years and then you had an annual renewal. And then what the business did, what my or 24 hour fitness did was they wrapped, you know, about $300 worth of personal training within that price point. Right. And so, and the, the idea and the thought behind that, the, when the, what the company knew it was so brilliant was the uh, life expectancy of a, a client as far as their, their business, right. Returning. Uh, if somebody who actually met with a personal trainer, if they saw a personal trainer, uh, they were more likely to continue on beyond three years. Far mm-hmm. more likely. Yes. yes. And if they did not see a personal trainer, it was much more likely they would fall off within months. Mm-hmm. And so they got really smart and said, hey, let's give this great membership deal away. Let's include personal training to encourage them to do it. Now, because uh, the consumer saw it as free because it came with the membership. They didn't realize they were really paying yeah. for it. That's the way they structured it. There were many people that didn't take advantage of this. Mm-hmm. They had three, four hundred dollars worth of personal training, but then they never even used it. And I'll tell you, Justin, since a lot of my job was centered around that and trying to get these people in and getting my trainers' schedules full, uh, almost all of them were men. It was very rare. Uh, that it was a woman that fell in this category that we're talking about right now. They almost always took advantage of it for all the reasons that I think Sal brought up. I yeah. think that at, at all of us, men and men and women, by that age, you know, you're north of 35, getting in your 40s or in your 40s, much more self-aware. Mm-hmm. Uh, your life, your lifestyle has changed. You know, you're probably at a place where you've either had kids or you have a job where you're sedentary a lot of time. You're not as physically active mm-hmm. as you used to be. So, the, and you maybe even have tried dieting several times or different things on your own and have probably failed or maybe had a little bit of success and then it came back on. And so you're at a point in your life because maybe you have some income, like you said, Sal, and you're like, okay, I'm at a place in my life now where I want to seek out professional health and women are just more likely to do that. Right. And yeah. in investing in a trainer or getting some good instruction, uh, it, it's a tremendous amount of value. I mean, I, w- I would say it's, you know, for every dollar invested, you probably get back $5 in in benefits in both health and, you know, how you learn how to work out and, and train yourself. Um, and, it, and I think you're, you you don't realize that until you're a little bit older, maybe a little bit uh, wiser. Now, I'm, I mean, to be clear, um, there's a lot of misconceptions too about people in their 40s. One of the misconceptions is that you're because you're in your 40s, you know, what do they say? 40s over your, over the hill, right? That's the old joke. You buy those birthday cards. I remember when I turned 40, yeah. people bought those for me. Like oh, It was a lot bigger deal, I felt like, uh, you know, when we were younger, like when somebody turned 40, that you'd yeah. get this like <laughs> this crazy party that that was like all over the hill, yeah. all doom and gloom. Yeah. It, no, and this and this is the truth now, 100%. Uh, now, I did train cl- women in their 20s and 30s, uh, I, of course, more in their 40s and, and older, the most fit women I ever trained uh, or the ones who got the best results were in their 40s. That's just a fact. If I got a woman in her in, you know, 25 years old and a woman who was 45, more often than not, the 45-year-old was consistent, would take the advice, and was very serious mm-hmm. about the workouts. And I can't tell you how many women I trained in their 40s who, after working out for a certain period of time, would say that to me. They'd say, I've never been this fit in my entire life. Never. This is the most fit I've ever been. Now, I have a theory to why that is, though. Like, I, I think that of all the demographics of people that are interested in personal training or exercise and, and fitness, they are, are marketed to the most and they've had the most bullshit fed mm. to them as far as how they should train, how yeah. they should diet, oh, yeah. what they should look like. And just wrong. Yeah, just all of it wrong. Yeah. The first, the, starting with the image of what someone fit looked like 20 years ago. Right. I mean, yeah. Covers of magazines were these anorexic looking girls. So already this this skinny anorexic image was what was promoted yeah. just 20 years ago. Then you add in the idea of- Aerobic oh, training. Yeah, aerobic classes and this yeah. these group high intensity- yeah, Don't lift weights, that'll oh, make you look was, bulky. Yeah, there was nothing but uh, uh, videos like I remember that was a big part of it, right? The aerobic videos, like it just kind of took uh, the landscape landscape by storm. Uh, and so you get a lot of like, that was like the, the conception of, of training was basically like doing all these like calisthenics and aerobic type uh, workouts. And this is why I think, or at least I had a lot of success with this age group. And and this sex was because I think they had been told so much bullshit Mm -hmm. that once I got a hold of someone like this, it was like, oh, my God, I have so much to teach you. 
and help <laughs> yeah. you with. You know what I'm saying? Like there's so many things that you've been told that is not true right. that I'm going to be able to help you out with that will really make a difference. Right. And, and again, there's a lot of misconceptions that your body all of a sudden, because you're 40, uh, is just going to respond terribly to exercise. And the reality is this. It's not that big of a difference from when you were 30. It really isn't. There's a difference, but it's small. And it, it pales in comparison to the difference that happens from proper training, proper sleep, proper exercise, and discipline, which, in my experience, women in their 40s crush compared to women who are much younger, probably because, again, they don't have time to waste. Mm -hmm. They've been marketed a bunch of bullshit. And by the way, this is why you know, women make up the – they're the consumer base for most products. Most pro the, 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 they are the consumers yeah. for most things, including in most households, they're the health ambassador. Right and for most for for fitness and health, uh, women are the are the big consumers. Gyms figured out this a long time ago. Gyms used to make no money, and then they figured out if we want to make money, we got to sell to this consumer base. And then they came out with all this bullshit to and lies that they would sell uh, to women. This is why women get marketed so heavily to, um, and and again, and also why there's a lot of bullshit that gets sold to them. And I think you're right, Adam. When they come to when they when they're ready to work out in their 40s. They've gone through all the other, other crap already. And they're at the point now where they're like, all right, uh, I'm done with all that. Mm -hmm. And what really works? I, I'm, 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 I'm consistent. My kids are a little bit older now. They're going to school. I got some time. Or I don't have a lot of time to waste, but the time I am going to dedicate, I'm going to be serious about this. And the results tend to blow. And as, like I said, this was one of my, this was one of my more, most successful categories of clients. Well, I think you need to go a little bit deeper into the statement you just made because there's 100%. I know there's definitely a handful, if not lots of women that just heard what you said and said, fuck you. It is much harder for me at 40 something than it was at 30 and 20 something. So, and, and we've all felt this before. I feel this today. It, feel, it feels hard. But what I, I'm aware of is that it has less to do with my age and it has more to do with my behaviors. Established at, patterns. Yeah, at 40 years old versus my behaviors at 20 years old. Right. Like, if, like, let me put it this way. So, if I, just to give you an example, I'm going to use uh, obviously general. I, I, if I had a client who was a woman in her 20s, versus one who is in her 40s. The one in the 20s feels like they can get away with a lot more. They're not usually not as nearly as, as serious or disciplined. Unless they're a hardcore athlete, it was pretty rare. Um, so they're less consistent. They're less uh, open to the right kind of advice. And what I mean by that is the right kind of advice means it's going to take work. It's going to take a little bit of time. Typically, people in their 20s don't want to hear that. They're like, oh, really? It's going to take me that long? Or I got to be all, no, I don't want to take this diet pill. Or I heard about this, whatever. Person in their 40s tends to be like, yeah, I know. I heard all that bullshit before. You're right. I'm going to do what you're telling me. So when you compare the difference physiologically and how your body responds in your 40s to 20s, and you compare that to discipline, exercise, diet, sleep, guess which one makes the biggest difference? By far, right? It's all those things that I just talked about. It's not the age. And again, this is why go into any gym in America, go into a, a gold gym, go into a world gym, go into a 24-hour fitness. The most fit women tend to be, this is true, in their 40s. Am I, uh, would you guys agree? No, no. I, yeah. I, I agree for all the other reasons we talked about. But this leads me to where I really want to go with this episode, which is I want to talk about, you know, and, and in particular, there's four big things, that big rocks that come to mind. Uh, on Sp Specific challenges. Yes, yeah, specific say. challenges that, uh, that would normally occur with this demographic yes. that I would have to overcome or help or we'd fix, right? Because I know, again, there's you know, a lot of ladies that are listening to this right now that are in that age group that hear you say that. And they're mm -hmm. no matter how many times you try and explain the science to them, they're going, I know it's harder. It feels harder. I can tell how much sure. harder it is right sure. now for me. But there's, I think there's an explanation for why that is. There is. And I, now I do want to say this uh, because I think it's good to give people some context, right? Or some, some parameters of what because I would get clients that would come to me and they'd say, you know, I want to be fit. I want to look healthy. Um, but they don't know specifically what that means. They know if they see it, but they don't know what that means. Like, what does that mean body fat percentage wise? What does that mean with my body? Oftentimes they'll have a weight goal. So they'll say, oh, I think I need to weigh 130. But I mean, gosh, you could weigh a certain weight and be, I mean, I, I weigh about 200 and I don't know, 215 pounds. I could be obese at 215 with a lot of body fat, or I could be very lean with a lot of muscle. Both look very, very different, right? So uh, I think it's important to kind of paint that picture. Most women in my experience, are very satisfied uh, with the way they look with a range of body fat that's anywhere between 18, which is very lean, to even as high as maybe 26, 27% uh, body fat, which isn't super high, 
but it's in, it, but it's it's up there. But it's also leanish, and you got some good curves here. So there's your range, and most people are happy. Most women, I would say, are happy within that. But with the following, strength, muscle, good posture, and good movement. When you add that to that body fat percentage range. Most women are very, very satisfied in my experience. And to back to your point, the reason why this matters is because a woman at 145 and uh, 18% body fat looks a lot different than a woman that is 130 and 26% body yeah, fat. Or 30% or right. whatever. Right. So un you need to understand that that the the scale and the, what you weigh, because you're right, a lot of, of these clients that I would get would be, oh, I want to get back to this weight. You know, they have a weight that they remember. They, yeah. they have this image of themselves at a point yeah. in their life, whether it was when they were teenage or 20s or 30s, whenever, and they and they know that, like, I want to get to that weight. Mm -hmm. And so I'd always have to be overcoming that. Listen, I, I can keep your weight right where you're at right now and build you the best body you've ever had. So weight doesn't matter so much. No, I, I had, I've told this story before. I love this story. It was actually one of the more effective sales techniques that I had as a gym manager. So one of my jobs as a gym manager was to get people into my club and convince them to obviously sign up for a membership and get personal training. I knew the value of personal training. I was a trainer for, for years and years and years. And that's not necessarily an easy task. Uh, there's a lot of myths and stuff that I have to, and I'm, I also had integrity. I'm not going to lie to people uh, like a lot of the fitness industry does by you know telling them crazy numbers of weight and whatever. And so uh, I had this amazing, uh, uh, just this technique that I had where someone would come in, a woman, and we would talk about her goals. And oftentimes she would say something like, you know, oh, I want to lose weight. And I'd say, how much? And then I'd say, what does that put your body weight at? And they'd say, okay, that's very interesting. Give me one second. And then I would, on my intercom, I would page. I had a female trainer that worked for me. I'm thinking of one in particular. I'd, I'd page her to my office. She'd walk in and this young lady who worked for me was about five, she's about five two. And she looked phenomenal, very fit, right? Very, very strong, very, very fit. And I'd have her come in and then I'd ask the potential member and I'd say, how much do you think she weighs? Be totally honest that she's totally fine with whatever number you, you put out there. And they'd say something like, oh, she looks like she weighs 105 pounds or like 110 pounds. I'd say, okay. And I had a scale in my office that said, now check this out. And I'd have her stand on the scale and she'd weigh, I think it was like 135 or 140 pounds. And it was my way of showing them that lean, you know, dense muscle looks phenomenal and looks very light. She mm -hmm. weighs a good 20, 30 pounds heavier than you thought. And yet she looks like she weighs what you think. So- so what's important is uh, the body fat percentage. What's important is to build a strong physique uh, for more than just looks, by the way. Not only do you look amazing, but you also are, now have a much faster metabolism. Because then mm -hmm. I would also ask this question to my trainer, my female trainer. What, do you, what did you eat for lunch today? And she would usually say something like, I had a super burrito or I had you know half a pound of steak with a, you know, two cups of rice or whatever. But like, she eats like a lot of men do, mm -hmm. but she burns it because she's got all that muscle. Well, it also supports uh, you know, just daily function. It supports activity. Uh, you know, it, it helps to el eliminate a lot of pain and aches and, and things like that. When, when you replace this body fat with, with muscle tissue, you know, that's something that actually like promotes uh, you know, a lot better uh, type of uh, you know abilities down the road. Well, so you just mentioned what I think is the first hurdle that I'd have to come over, which is the metabolism. Yes. So, and, and I think there's multiple reasons for this, but this would be the first thing that I'd have to address. Um, yeah, can we get your body, or, or which we, we can, let's get your body to burn more calories on its own versus what you probably think you need to do, which is burn more calories uh, yourself through exercise, which is a losing strategy. Mm -hmm. This is a fact, by the way. Trying to burn calories through exercise as a way to get leaner is a losing, failing strategy. We know this. Studies have proven it. I've seen it in, in the years I've managed gyms. This is not an effective strategy. Here's why. I'll just give you an easy way to explain it. An hour of intense exercise may burn you anywhere between 400 to 500 calories. And I'm being generous here, okay? About four or 500 calories. It takes the average person 10 minutes to eat that many calories, you know, 400, 500 calories. Yeah. So it's a lot of work to burn that many calories. Very easy to eat those calories. And in order to burn those calories, you got to do an hour hard working out every single day or more, sometimes twice a day. Why don't we instead train your body to burn more calories on its own? So you don't have to do tons of work to burn these extra calories. And the best way to do that is to build strength 
and build muscle. Well, part of this hurdle too is this. So never did this ever happen. Did I ever have a, a client that came to me, female client in this age group that wanted to lose, lose fat. Never did I ever have someone come in and go and I assess their diet and they're eating McDonald's three times a day and Oreo cookies for dinner and ice cream and they're consuming four or 5,000 calories a day no. and they go, Adam, help me out. That never happened. In fact, what actually normally happens almost always is I, I get them and they're like, they show me what they're eating and they're only eating 1,300, 1,800, maybe 2,000 yeah, calories. 30 grams of protein for the whole day. Yet very low calorie, yeah. but yet carrying 30, 40, 50 pounds of body fat on them that they want to get rid of. And they're just at a place in their life where they're like, I don't, I don't understand, Adam. I'm at this place where I, you know, and in, in their defense, they don't eat bad. Right, they don't eat what "quote unquote" bad looks like for average. They're not eating fast food. They're not cramming ice cream. They're not drinking like crazy. They're not big sweet eaters. They're just in a place right now in their life where their metabolism has slowed down so much that anything outside of the chicken salad that they were eating a day would end up piling body fat. And that's normally how they feel. I'd always ask them that. I'd say, you know, do you feel like you eat really good and then every once in a while you enjoy yourself and you feel like it sticks to your body right away? Mm -hmm. And they like, yes. Yes, that's exactly me, and that's oh. caused from excessive yo-yo dieting for so yeah. many years. It yeah. just sucks because you know there's two methods of operation that are promoted so much, uh, and, and I get this all the time with, uh, you know, cut calories like to to lose body fat. We just got to keep cutting calories and keep going down that that path, and then if that's not working, now we got to ramp up the cardiovascular and burn more calories that way. These two together have just been like promoted so long, and, and you know, with with ladies that I trained, it was like always such a hurdle to, to tackle right the, away. the loss of muscle mass is a big deal look here okay this is the truth now when you look at women and you look at women over the age of 40 40 osteopenia which is bone mass loss this is what happens before you have osteoporosis your bones start to weaken it's actually quite common by the way uh, osteopenia is connected to loss of muscle if your muscles are weak and you don't have much, they anchor and hold on to bone, your bones get weak. One of the best ways to reverse that in your bone is to build muscle. In fact, it's the best way. If you want to strengthen your bones, just get stronger muscles. So there's your clue. This is what's happening to you. So you're 40, you've had, or you're in your 40s, you've now had, I don't know, a decade or so or longer of a lot of inactivity. You know, Maybe you, you, you work at a desk. You probably work at a desk. You don't really do a lot of physical heavy lifting um, in your day-to-day -day life. Um, you're busy, but sedentary. Your body adapts by reducing muscle. Well, or that, or you've also done a lot of uh, on the wagon, off the wagon. Right? Yes. You've done a lot of like, because you might hear, someone might be listening right now going like, nah, Sal, I'm not lazy. That also. Right. Mm -hmm. I've, I've definitely, I definitely train hard or I love this Orange Theory class or I've done these things. But what they end up doing is the the, the classic yo-yoing where they're on the wagon, mm -hmm. low calorie, extreme working out for months at a time, then fall off the wagon. Look at look at the study of, studies of women who do lots of cardio and look at them in the osteopenia and here's what you'll find. Let's say you're a runner. You did lots and lots and lots of running because you found that that, you, you read that that burns a lot of calories. The bone mass in your lower body will improve a little bit. The bone mass everywhere else doesn't, okay? Cardiovascular activity is not a, it's better than nothing, but it's not a great way to strengthen bone and it's also not a great way to strengthen muscle. Endurance type training requires little muscle that is efficient with calories. So over the years, if you've done either either you're sedentary, which like I said earlier, or you do lots of cardio and cut your calories, both of which result in loss of muscle mass. Again, they have studies on this that show that women mm -hmm. that men and women both when they diet and do cardio and they lose let's say 20 pounds, more than half of the weight that they lose is muscle mass. The body literally is adapting to slow down its own metabolism. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest problems that you're going that you're probably encountering if you are a woman in your 40s looking to get in better shape is reversing the loss of muscle that has happened. What is the best way to do that? Lift weights, traditional resistance training, straight sets, compound lifts. I had so so many times I would get a, a female client in her 40s who's worked out in the past, right? Done all the cardio, done the aerobics classes, dieted this and that. And then I have them in, in, working with me, and I'm like, "Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna squat. We're gonna deadlift. We're gonna bench press. We're gonna row." And they're like, "I don't want to. You know, I'm hiring you, but I don't want you to make me look like a bodybuilder." And say, "Look, here's the deal. I promise you won't wake up tomorrow." looking like a bodybuilder, if you get to the point 
where you where you look in the mirror and you're like, I don't want any more muscle. You just tell me. You just tell me when you're done with that. And here's what happened. Never would that happen. Instead, here's what would happen to me. I can't believe how good I'm feeling. Why am I getting leaner? I feel like yeah. I'm eating more. And I'd be like, you are eating more. You just have a faster metabolism. My God, my butt looks really good. My, my, I feel so confident in my body. And I'm like, you're stronger and you have more Fast muscle. Faster metabolism, stronger. Also, like the hormone issue. Like when, when you're in that state for so long, think about what that does to your hormones and disrupts all that and the out of balance and out of whack. Um, I mean, we go through the list of like sleep, uh, you know, nutrition, and also like exercising. Those are major, major factors to, to getting you, tilting you off axis of your of your hormones. Yes. So to give you, so if I were to categorize uh, the, the more popular forms of exercise, if we were to look at cardiovascular activity and compare it to resistance training, cardiovascular activity is anti-tissue. Okay. So cardiovascular burns lots of calories while so you're it doing it. for catabolic. Right. It, it, it burns lots of calories yeah. while you're doing it. And it teaches your body, or at least the adaptation your body tries to, to, to move towards from it is to become more efficient with calories, which is loss of muscle mass. So lots and lots of cardio over time with nothing else, especially with the reduction in calories, results in loss of muscle mass, okay? Resistance training is pro-tissue, pro-tissue, proactive tissue. The main adaptation from resistance training is building muscle. What is required to build muscle? It, not just calories, and yes, you'll, you'll be able to eat more so you have a faster metabolism, but what's also required is balanced hormones. Your body, through the process of telling it to build muscle, in men you see a boost in testosterone, in women you see the balancing of estrogen and progesterone. In the other category of overdone mm -hmm. cardio, what a, what a wonderful way to get your hormones out of whack. In fact, the, most of the women I've trained and worked with who also concurrently worked with a functional medicine doctor who had hormone issues, Oftentimes, one of the reasons why the hormones were out of whack was the abuse of the wrong form of exercise. And this is right. this is how we've been labeled, okay, as anti-cardio guys. Sure. We've been labeled at that from this podcast because we've been touting this for a very long time now. And this is the reason why. So if you've been listening in- It's the abuse of cardio. And That's it, the problem. And it's, this is because this is the majority of people we help. Mm -hmm. We're all three of us, different gyms, different careers- Yet we all agree that this is the the masses. This is yes. the mo this yeah. is the majority. The most common things we saw. That's right. This is the majority of people that are seeking help, that are trying to better themselves, that are in the gyms working out, that are listening to podcasts like this, that are seeking out this information. And that's why we talk about this all the time. It's not because we think cardio is bad. It's not because we think that we don't understand the benefits of it. It's because we know that 90% of the majority of people that we train, it's not ideal for them for the situation they're currently in. Yes. So mm -hmm. Cardiovascular activity does have some health benefits, but if you're the like most of the clients we worked with, and let's say you're a woman in your 40s and you want to improve your health and fitness, get leaner, focus on building muscle. By the way, I said it was pro tissue. The side effect of the pro tissue is the anti fat uh, aspect of it because as you build muscle, as we said earlier, the metabolism speeds up and the hormones move in a direction that reduces body fat. How? You get more insulin sensitive women's estrogen and progesterone balance, mm -hmm. women's testosterone levels start to regulate. Yes, women do have testosterone, and it is important in women as well for things like libido, confidence, and drive. All those things start to balance out to make you a better muscle-building, fat-burning machine. So the way, the cornerstone of your routine should be traditional resistance training. And this was always the, the, the very first thing that I would start with with a woman uh, in her 40s. Now, there's another part uh, that we need to talk about, which is, which is mobility. Loss of mobility. Now, well, before you go to mobility, there's still another part of the weight training that is because there is a there is a percentage of these clients that I would get that were weight training. Okay, that weren't just cardio bunnies. They they understood the benefits of weights, but they still have been marketed to the wrong way. They have been still pushed in this direction of either circuit training or high reps because low weight cardio with weights. Yes, <laughs> basically, exactly, exactly. They've been they've been pushed in this. Yeah, but hit, they don't realize that hit training direction or. Don't do heavy weights because that's going to make you big and bulky. So there is a, another portion yeah, to the, right. the loss of the loss of muscle here, or the not or not building muscle is for that you're reason. Right. Just because you're holding a dumbbell or a barbell or a resistance band does not mean you're doing resistance training the way that we're talking about. Because you could use a dumbbell in a way that makes it cardio. You could actually use a dumbbell in the way that makes it yoga. Yeah. You know, there is a, a specific way to apply resistance to build muscle, speed up the metabolism, sculpt the body, and balance hormones. So pro workout programming is very, very important when it comes to resistance strength. It's not just using weights. Yes. It's using weights in a specific way to accomplish what we had uh, just talked about. Yep. Now to the point that I was talking about with mobility. 
Mobility issues are a bigger problem with people in their 40s. and As they get older, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s becomes a bigger issue. But it's not necessarily because the body is aging, but rather because you've had longer time on this planet to develop mm -hmm. poor movement patterns, right? So you've been sitting for longer. Yeah, you've you've been sort of locked in your ways. Yes. And this is what we've noticed. Uh, and, and this is something I'm always fighting. I'm like, oh, I feel old. I have like grown just to like tie my shoes anymore. But honestly, it's just because of the, the daily things that I'm always doing. I'm always doing things in front of me. And if I'm not, you know, aware of that and, and I'm not like going through types of, of mobility drills or things to help my joints, you know, inevitably my body's going to form into those positions yeah, and it's going to make it more uh, you know efficient the way that i do things yeah and it, it's just you have a longer time on earth to injure yourself or to deal with these types of things right so you're longer time to be wearing heels heels cause movement patterns that can cause problems longer time that you've been sitting at a desk that can cause uh, certain issues now why is it important to focus on mobility okay well besides the prevention of injury which definitely important because Nothing will stop you in your tracks like hurting yourself. You hurt yourself, that's it. You're done. You can't go to the Which, gym. Which, by the way, statistically, this is what is most common that happens to somebody that joins a gym. So yes. one of the main reasons why someone falls off besides hitting a plateau is within that first four to six weeks, they, they get hurt. They get hurt. They get hurt. So that's number one, of course. But there's more than that. So let's say you're somebody that's like, look, I'm not going to hurt myself. I'm careful. I don't need to work on mobility. Well, here's why mobility is still important. Your lack of mobility or your lack of optimal mobility prevents you from maximizing or getting the most out of the most effective exercises. So I named a few earlier, right? Like a, a deadlift, a squat, or an overhead press. If your mobility prevents you from getting all the maximum benefits of that exercise, you're just not going to progress as fast. And oftentimes, uh, people in their 40s or women in their 40s, this is the reason why they can't do some of these amazing exercises. It wasn't because the exercise was, oh, we're not doing that exercise. It was because I would take them through an assessment. We'd do a deadlift and I'd say, you know what? We need to focus on your mobility yeah. before we can There's have There's a you lot of limitations uh, you know, in front of that. Yeah, I can't, I can't have you really deadlift in a way that's effective yet because we need to improve our mobility. Or I can't have you do these overhead presses and really push them yet because we have to work on mobility. So mobility is very, very important because it becomes something that can prevent you from maximizing that little bit of time that you have that you can spend uh, in the gym. I feel like this one of all the points is is the least sexist. I think it it, it, it carries over to men oh, yeah. equally the same. Mm -hmm. It's more this is more to do with age and time, yep, right? Yep. Just the longer that we neglect this when we're in our 20s, all of us even trainers uh, sitting here right now yeah, are get away with a lot. Are guilty of this. Yep. I'm guilty of training in my 20s and not addressing any of this stuff because it was this it wasn't loud enough to stop me, right? Mm -hmm. And I was too stubborn to th put any sort of energy or effort in this direction mm -hmm. because I was so focused on the way I looked. That's mm -hmm. what I cared about. And then when you get into your 40s, I don't care, male or female, you, this is no longer an option to ignore anymore. Yeah, your body that, is talking to you by this time. Yeah, now life. you have pain from cumulative injuries that you've dealt with from the 20s and 30s. Like, I hurt my back twice, and now mm -hmm. it kind of bothers me. Or like I said earlier, I, I sit down a lot. You know, In my 20s, I didn't sat, sit down as long. But now that I'm yeah. 40, I've been sitting down for 20 years at my desk. That's a huge that's point. That's going to cause problems. That's a huge point. I think people don't realize, like, you know, earlier, like when I'm in my 20s, or like I'm going through school, there's a lot more opportunities for me to get up and 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 get involved in some type of movement or, or be involved in a sport or, you know, just something like extracurricular uh, where like every day I'm going to be doing something with my body and expressing a lot of these muscles. There's not a lot of opportunities for that as you get older. And when, you, and when you're training, the, one of the worst things that you can do is because you have shoulder issues, low back issues, hip issues, wrist issues, is avoid specific exercises because of that because it, it is only going to make that problem worse. Yes. I, I was literally just, Justin, you just did a, a wrist mobility thing the other day. And mm -hmm. it was such great timing because I have a, a client of mine, a female client of mine that falls in this demographic that I was uh, helping, right? And I know she's got all this wrist stuff. She's had surgery on her wrist. And a lot of times that she doesn't like the deadlift and stuff because it bothers her wrist. And she wants to avoid certain exercises. And I'm constantly harping on her. Like, listen, you've got to do this because you cannot avoid these mobility exercises because you don't it use it you. you lose it yeah and and mm -hmm. what you got to understand is you eliminating these exercises which are such important good exercises for us to be doing because it bothers your wrist is not the answer the answer is we need to address mm -hmm. the lack of mobility that you have in your wrist you need to do the work before you well, there's see a me. ripple effect to that right? yes so uh, now yeah you limit that and it goes up the kinetic chain now it limits like a lot more movements uh, in the future oh yeah i mean to use an extreme example um you know i remember working with people 
people in, in much older age categories, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I had a physical therapist in my facility and we would work very closely. And I remember the therapist made a point about this. She said, look, she would tell these, these people because we would work both work with, with them together. I'd be the trainer, she'd be the therapist. And she'd say stuff like, okay, I know your doctor's telling you that you know maybe you should start using a walker. But she goes, I want to prevent you from using a walker as long as possible because the second you use a walker, your posture is going to get worse and your body's going to shape and form to it and you're going to lose the ability to walk without it very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're talking about. If you avoid fundamental movements like a squat because it bothers you and you're not doing anything to get yourself to squat, then the further along you go that way, the more likely you are to never be able to squat, mm -hmm. right? So mobility is very important. So resistance training should be the cornerstone of your routine to build that muscle, boost your metabolism. But a piece of that should be to maintain and improve your mobility so you can maximize the effects of the resistance training and prevent those injuries. Now, the next hurdle that I think is common, and again, this one I think is both men and women, but for sure I feel like I, I dealt with this the most with my female clients, especially the ones that are, running a household too, maybe have kids also working and trying to juggle all this. And I feel like my, my moms and, and the, and the women I trained always put everybody else, uh, before themselves, mm, you know, right. I think w women are just born with this, this em empathetic soul already where, you know, they take care of the family. Oh, so, so well. studies actually show that, that even when there's a husband and wife that work, the wife still does statistically far more of the stuff at home. When, when they would come to me and tell me, and when I was an early trainer, I was a young trainer, I didn't take this very seriously, right? I didn't take it seriously until I had kids myself and I could see the, the struggle or whatever. But they'd say things like, I don't have a lot of time. I don't have a lot of time to come into the gym and work out all the time. And then I would do the whole like spiel that you do when you're an inexperienced, stupid trainer, like, oh, time, we all have 24 hours. You got to prioritize your time. If you get fit, it makes everything else e easier, blah, 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 blah. Uh, totally not empathetic or understanding of what they were going through. Later on, I figured out, uh, oh, yeah. This is a big issue. This is actually the, the realest issue. I'd say the biggest challenge. The other stuff that we're talking about is not nearly as challenging as the time issue. And so then I said, okay, the, the goal is to be to make your workout as effective as possible and to give you flexibility with your workout so you can be consistent when you can't make it to the gym, to make it consistent when you are traveling for whatever reason. Make it as easy as possible to stay consistent and maximize the time mm -hmm. that you are working out so that this doesn't end up becoming a huge roadblock for you. So this is the exact same disservice that I did to this community is the same thing. Like I, and I feel guilty of it because in my 20s, I was just as naive. Mm -hmm. I would do the exact same spiel. It was always, it was about, you need to make time for yourself. And, and then I, and I, would, and I'd make a good case, but I the mean, way. there's truth to that. I, yeah. I would sell it really yeah. well. So I'd sell it really well that, you know, if you take care of yourself, all these other things, other people and things you're doing, you'll only approve, improve on that. Instead of being more empathetic about okay, how do we how do we juggle this a little bit? How do I uh, be a little more understanding that no matter how much I sell her on this idea, I'm never going to get this mom to put herself above her children or her husband. That comes six days a week or five. Right, days a week yeah, gym. exactly. And come to the gym. Those things are never so. How and I wish I would have done this earlier on. Later on, I learned to to mold my programming where it wasn't it wasn't required that she came into the gym all the time. Yes, I would have a, a, a foundation of this is what I'd like you to do. But then I was also very realistic that there's going to be times when maybe I only get 30 minutes mm -hmm. or maybe I, I I don't have a lot of equipment and I have to give her something that she doesn't stop working on herself, but she has something that she could do when her kid's napping for an hour or when she's got a 30 minute break. The most effective strategy I had for this was giving my clients, my female clients in this category, workouts to do plan B workouts when mm -hmm. you can't make it to the gym. Because here's the reality. Driving to the gym, that's time right there. Changing at the gym, there's time right there. Then you get your workout. You've already killed 15, 20 minutes, maybe even 30 minutes before you start your workout. And now you're somewhere else. You're not at home yeah. where you need to find somebody to watch the kids. Maybe you can put them in the kids club, but that's not open all the time. So, so what I would do is I would give them workouts that they could do anywhere at any time, right? Mm -hmm. Here's some exercise. Here's some routines. Here's some, you know, band movements. Bands are, are really, really convenient because you could travel with them. They take up almost no space. And I'd give them great workouts. And then if, they, if they're like, look, man, today was crazy or – the sitter canceled. I can't go to the gym. That doesn't mean I, I don't have to, I don't, I don't work out. I can work out right here. I yeah. can work out at home. Such an effective strategy. And it dramatically increased the consistency that these clients had with their workouts. And it's very important. So here's one of the things about, uh, about working out and being consistent. It's like a, it's like a snowball going down a hill. 
what, if you're consistent with your workouts, consistent, consistent, it's easier to stay consistent when you're consistent. It's hard to stay consistent when you stop for a second. Mm -hmm. It's like the momentum has been broken. Well, a lot of it too. I mean, we overcomplicate uh, the, the entire process. And I, and I know there's a lot of trainers out there guilty of that too. And like promoting that within their clientele of like, you know, we got to accomplish all these different movements, all these different things, you know, and, and wrap it all in the workout ends up taking like an hour, two hours long where, you know, you get in a predicament like this. They need to know that there are just a few simple like biggest bang for your buck type movements and things that you can do pretty much anywhere and that, that's still going to keep the momentum going in the right direction yeah, that's absolutely. definitely our fault and our egos of our, yeah. our camps you know that's like one of the worst parts well you of think everybody's space. a fitness fanatic like you are when you're a trainer and they have no they have all the time they work in a gym like you do which is just not true so this is a very important one okay so if you're listening right now understand you probably already know this that your time is precious and it's challenging to, to get lots of time just to yourself have plan B workouts that you could do anywhere and make them convenient. Uh, usually bands are one of the best things you could do in these kinds of workouts because, like I said, I could store a full set of bands in a small duffel bag or in the corner of my closet, and I can. And they usually come with attachments that you could put in doors and stuff. And there you go. You have your resistance, yeah. and you could do your workout. Easy. Now, now, the last hurdle, I kind of alluded to it when we were talking about the slower metabolism because I think they do go hand in hand. Uh, I talked about yo-yo diet. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is for sure the most common. I, I, I brought up the fact that I don't think I've ever had somebody that was a female client in their 40s that was trying to lose weight that was eating three, 4,000 calories. No. They were always much lower than where I would like them to be. And mm -hmm. so that is one of the, I think we talk about all the challenges. This is the most difficult because it takes time. It does. Yeah. It takes time. They've probably gone through a few diets themselves by this point, uh, You know, whether they be extreme diets, uh, where they're cutting out entire food groups or even crazier diets. I've actually had people come to me uh, who've done HCG diets. I don't know if you've ever heard of these, but mm -hmm. it's they inject HCG and they go and they eat 500 calories a day uh, for, uh, for a certain period of time or whatever. So then they come to me and it's and now what we're doing is we're working on, okay, how can we change your relationship to food? Because here's the deal with nutrition, and this is this is a big point here. Your nutrition, your diet should not feel like another stress. Okay, so if you're trying to eat in a way to get leaner, to improve your health and your fitness, it should not be an additional stress because I promise you, if it feels that way, you will not be able to continue. No, if you're doing something to make yourself feel better, but it makes you feel worse, it's not gonna, you're not going to continue it, right? So your nutrition cannot be another stress. This is where I start to work with people on uh, things like intuitive eating, where we start to talk about how do foods make you feel? Um, how are you using food? Are you finding that you're eating in, in a way to distract yourself? Are you eating because you're stressed? Um, can we create barriers between you and these behaviors? For example, I'll give you a great example. I had a client once who she chocolate was her thing. She was like a, a, a chocolate fanatic. And she's like, man, it's so hard for me. If I have it in the house, I'm going to eat it. So I said, okay, let's do this. Uh, not have it in the house. She's like, I already tried that. But then I end up, you know, I, I, I want it around. I said, no, no, no. I'm not saying you can't eat it. I'm saying don't have it in the house. If you want it bad enough, you get in the car and drive yourself to the store and buy it. Make that deal with yourself. And all we did was we created a barrier between her and that you know impulsive behavior. And here's what happened. She would get up and drive to the store and buy some chocolates sometimes. But sometimes, because of the process of stopping, getting in the car or whatever, it gave her enough time to pause and be like, okay, this is a bit impulsive. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm going to eat it this time. And it was a great way to get her to eat in a more healthy, intuitive way. When you do this, through this process, nutrition isn't as stressful. Think of it this way. If you're eating healthy because it feels good to you, because you enjoy it, because you're taking care of your body, um, then it's not hard. And I don't mean hard in the sense that it doesn't require planning. I mean, it's not hard in the sense it doesn't feel like a stress. Well, what's hard is that this is a slower process. Yes. It's a slower process. It, and, and what's really difficult is the client is coming to you at this point, right? They just hired you. And they are, they're they're willing to pay you money to help them get this weight off, and that's what they want to hear. They want to hear. Yeah, tell me what to eat. How? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Tell yeah. me what to eat. How long until I can lose this thirty pounds or whatever? And the truth is, the, the the what you need to do with them is completely change their relationship with food. And part of that process is actually not worrying about their weight. Mm -hmm. It's not worrying about it if it goes up a couple of pounds at this point because we need to get to a place yeah. where we're fed more. You're already so low calorie. And here's the other thing too. We mentioned already the first and most important thing was 
was for you to build muscle. You can't build muscle on 800 calories. Right. It's just you can't build it in a cut. You, you, you need the building blocks. You need the calories. You need the protein mm -hmm. in order to build the muscle, to build to build the faster metabolism. So it's your, you're fighting an uphill battle for somebody who's weight training, strength training to build muscle, but they're eating in a way to cut and lose. What you're dealing with is your own psychology. That's the challenge when it when it comes to nutrition. Okay, the challenge isn't the the mechanisms of nutrition, but rather your own psychology. So here's a here's an easy tip. This is an easy one. Rather than restricting yourself, which what tends to happen when you restrict, when you cut things out, is you end up in this restrict binge uh, behavior where you're cutting foods out that you enjoy or whatever, or maybe you're using because they're they're you know they help you deal with stress or anxiety or you're bored or whatever. You cut these foods out that you enjoy for whatever reason. And the, re the way you're cutting it out is through sheer discipline. I can't eat that. And it's like you're telling yourself, you're not going to eat that anymore. And you're like, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. Eventually, you hate the way that feels because nobody likes to be told what to do, even if it's you. And then you go in the opposite direction. And it's usually not having a little bit of what you didn't eat before. It's like going crazy because mm -hmm. you're rebelling, mm -hmm. almost like the behaviors of, uh, of a teenager. So instead of restricting, try this. Try adding things to your diet. This is yeah. a great and, – and this sounds crazy, but it actually works. Take some things that are healthy – that you're maybe lacking in your diet. Usually this looks like vegetables for, for some people. For some people, it might be proteins. Mm -hmm. And say to yourself, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to restrict, but I'm going to make sure I eat three servings of, of, of well-cooked vegetables. Or I make sure I'm going to have a nice salad that's really, really healthy uh, every single day. Or I'm going to make sure I drink uh, at least a half a gallon of water a day. So you're adding things rather than taking things away. Psychologically, it feels totally different. You're not restricting, you're adding. And here's what ends up happening through this process. Naturally, you start to cut things out yeah. without even realizing. This is one of my favorite things to watch. You know, watch the transformation happen because it's subtle. It's something that, uh, you know, they're adding, like, let's say it's a, a broccoli or it's some kind of vegetable that, you know, maybe they're deficient in certain nutrients in their diet. It's just naturally their palate starts to change. They mm -hmm. start to crave different things and, and they start uh, finding themselves longing for that feeling that they're getting from it instead of hammering themselves for not, you know, going towards these foods that they they deem so, uh, you know, unhealthy for them. This, this is such a key strategy. And it's tough if you don't have a trainer, right? So you have to have the self-awareness to do this yourself if you're listening to podcasts and taking this advice. But I, I love what you're saying, Sal, because I I loved not telling a client you can't. You can't have. Like, sure, yeah. you can have it. But then what I, what I made sure of is to have communication around that. So let's say that person went and crush that chocolate bar. I'm not going to scold them as their trainer and say, oh my God, you fucked up yeah. and now we're going to get fat, blah, blah, blah. No. What I am going to do though is say, how did you feel afterwards? How did you sleep that night? How was your skin? How was the next day? How was your mood? How was your digestion? I'm, how was your, all these things that food, the stuff that you put inside you affects mm -hmm. and help them connect that. And then when they streak three days in a row of doing exactly what you just, you guys both suggested, which is, you know, increasing their protein or eating a salad a day or three servings of vegetables, you know, cooked vegetables in the day. Then I would say things like, how did you feel? Mm -hmm. How was your stool? How did you sleep? And then helping them make that connection of why they make that choice that's not related to their scale or the weight going up or down or how they look, but more so how their body felt, how their mood felt, how their energy felt, helping them make that connection that, wow, when I feel my my body with these choices that are maybe less palatable. Hey, it might be less palatable. Boy, the benefits that I get and the things that I feel from it are amazing. And hey, you know what? When I have that thing that's really palatable and I enjoy that part of it, boy, I tell you what, it actually, it might satisfy me for that one minute that I'm consuming it, but the aftermath of how I feel, and then on their own, they start to weigh that out themselves. You start to crave things that make you feel good. This is true, okay? By the way, but you know, advertising companies know this. When they present a food on, on a commercial, they're not just showing you the food. They're showing you like a party in the background or it's really cool or look how relaxed the person is. They're trying to make associations to make you want the food even more. So when you make these good associations with certain foods, let's say you eat, let's say you notice when you eat three servings of vegetables that you're no longer constipated and your skin looks really good. And you're paying attention to this, by the way, because if you're not aware of it, it doesn't matter, but you're paying attention. You're like, you know what, man, when I eat three servings of vegetables, my hair looks good. My skin looks good. I got good digestion. I'm not constipated like I normally am. I feel really good. And you start making those connections, you will start to find that you'll actually crave those vegetables. Now, it might not be the same type of craving, like I crave the taste of those vegetables, but you'll want them just like you would something that tastes good. Yeah, but good. that's the problem. Right. For so long, and then by the way, again, this is back to the marketing and advertising side of, of, of our world, right? It's like, 
the, everything is about how it tastes. So we've been taught that way. That that's the only thing you value. Yeah. Like, does it taste good? Yeah. You know, that's the first thing, you know, you should try this. Does it taste good? Like, right. that's the very first thing. Nobody goes like, well, how did it make you feel? Right, you right, know? right, right. Nobody asks when someone suggests a <laughs> restaurant or suggests food to you. No one ever says, oh, did you shit well afterwards? <laughs> or how did you sleep that, that night? Corn dog made me feel great. Right. Yeah. Nobody thinks about that. No. It's always about taste. But when, you, when you're setting on a, a goal like this and we're trying to change your life and your health and your behaviors, you have to start to think like this. You have to start making these connections because 100 percent all yeah. that food affects that. And, and now here's another point is that to identify some foods that bring you away away from awareness now that sounds very complicated so I'm gonna say it a different way start to identify and identify foods that trigger uh, impulsive behaviors. These usually are in the category of heavily processed foods. Now here's what the science says about heavily processed foods. And by the way, heavily processed foods typically are found in wrappers, in boxes. They have lots of ingredients. They're typically not single ingredient foods, like a steak is not heavily processed, but you know, or or you know, a, a, just rice by itself is not heavily processed, but rice chips, you know, that are, you know, ranch flavored would be heavily processed, for example. So heavily processed foods when they do the science, they show that when people are left to eat them and they compare them to other groups, they eat on average five to six hundred more calories a day, and they eat almost forty percent faster while they're eating it. It literally encourages these impulsive behaviors. Identify that for yourself. It's usually heavily processed foods for most people. Now, why is this important? Because it's it's making you aware that if I eat these kinds of foods, it brings me away from awareness. I become more impulsive. I eat faster. I eat more, and it's something that is hard to control. Once you know that, then you can say to yourself. I think I'm going to stay away from that because that makes me behave in this particular way. Instead, I eat these whole natural foods. I mean, I'll tell you what, right now, this is a true story. I figured this out a long, long time into my career, but when I did, it was a game changer. I would tell clients, all right, here's just one thing. Just do this. Don't eat heavily processed foods, but eat as much as you want. I don't care. I don't care what it is. If it's not heavily processed, go ahead and eat, eat until you're totally full. You know what would happen? Everybody would lose weight. Yeah. Everybody would lose weight because it's really hard to overeat. It is you. You naturally start to your body's systems of satiety start to work the way that they're supposed to. Heavily processed foods hijack that. So identify that they bring you away from awareness and make you more impulsive with your behavior. Along the lines of awareness, I have to add something to that that I find myself saying today that I wasn't saying 15, 20 years ago, and I think that's just the time that we're in now. And when you talk about awareness, you also, so the hyper palatable foods is one thing. The other thing is just being purely distracted. We live in this tech world right. where your phones are an extension. It's like another limb for people or the television, right? Or an iPad or whatever tool you have to consume this content, right? If you're at a place where you're trying to learn this, you're trying to learn your body's natural signals that it's talking to you and you have no clue what we're talking about and you want to figure this out, another piece of advice that I'm going to give around awareness is do not allow yourself to bring your phone to the table or do not eat in front of the television. Yeah, sit down. Yes. Eat by yourself. Eat quietly. Chew your food. Think about the food. Slow your heart rate down. Yeah. Be there with your food. In fact, you know, people who say, oh, I enjoy eating a lot. This is, it's actually a, a very unaware uh, state yes. of mind. Think about the last, if you're listening right now, think about the last time you did something that resembled a binge. Maybe you ate a bag of chips or a sleeve of Oreo cookies. Typically, the behavior looks like this. You're not enjoying the, the cookie that's in your mouth. You're eating the cookie in your mouth so fast because mm -hmm. all you can think about is the other one right. in your hand. It isn't even about the food that's you in your get mouth. Them in. It's about the food that isn't in your mouth. This is literally a mental state of unawareness. You're distracted. You're you're it's impulsive. Eating and awareness is I'm sitting down quietly, no distractions. I'm eating and I'm chewing and I'm I'm there. I'm here with my food. When people bring awareness to their eating, they naturally eat less. This is a fact. Studies have shown. In fact, they've compared groups of people who've done awareness practicing exercises to people who follow you know, macro and calorie targets. And guess which one is more successful long term? The awareness. They don't even have to count well, anything. They're just I'll, more aware. I'll take this challenge all day long right here. Yeah, yeah, you, you're somebody listening right now and you need to lose weight and you only have two rules. I'm not going to put a diet together for you. I'm not going to tell you you can't have this or that. The only thing I want you to do is choose, like you said, whole foods 
and never eat in front of a television or your phone. You I, watch what happens. I dare you to try and get fat that way. <laughs> yeah. Ain't gonna happen. Yeah. It's just not gonna happen. Yeah. It's it's already hard enough to do it with the whole foods angle that you're talking about mm -hmm. with potatoes and steaks. Potatoes and steak did not get people fat. It's no. all it's adding that. It's the French fries that you added yes. to that. It's the dessert you added to that. It's the soda that you drank down with that. It's the highly processed, pal hyper palatable foods that you add in combination with these whole foods. That is what's really screwing you. So just you simply doing that and not being distracted while you consume, most people, believe it or not, are yeah. even people that have never trained themselves to be aware of these signals will feel these signals. Absolutely. And I, again, it took me a long time to figure that out, but I loved it when I did because it was like, boom, magic. It's working and it's working simple forever. So there you have it. Okay. Focus on building muscle, getting stronger, work on mobility, make that a part of your routine. Uh, make sure you have a plan B with your workouts that you could do anywhere and focus on intuitive eating rather than following a diet. And you are going to be about 90% of the way there. The other 10% is just you showing up. Uh, look, we have a lot of free guides you can find uh, and read that we've written about lots of topics around fitness. And we did this as a way to give back to our community. You can find all of these at mindpumpfree.com. And you can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. What are, the, what are people starting with? They're starting with the wrong impression is what they're starting with. Okay. And, and, and I think you have to address that first because if you made a pie chart out of everything that you're going to do to enhance performance, you'll find that this pie cut for drugs is probably 15 or